Shalom, shalom, shalom to everyone watching. This is Rabbi Moshe Otero with the Ways of Israel. So shalom and welcome uh, this morning to our class on Sefer Karim. We're now in chapter 15 of book number four of Sefer Karim, And as I mentioned before, um, this class and all the classes on Sefer Karim is dedicated to the memory of Yehuda Natan Albo, who passed away over a year ago, and I'm doing this for the lifting of his soul, and also in memory of his, a very good friend, and do miss him dearly, and thus this uh, these classes are being done for that sake. If you wish to uh, dedicate or sponsor one of these shiurims, please let me know. Write me to at Rabbi Otero. Uh, yahoo.com or contact me at 786-306-8211. So we're going to go right into our class this morning. Um, it's somewhat uh, repetitive since <clears throat> Rabbi Abba begins to return to the topic of the two ways, you know, why, why uh, the righteous suffers adversity while the wicked seems to prosper. <coughs> this question in chapter 15, he mentions, uh, since Asaph stated these problems and solved them, as we have seen, why did the prophets who came after concern themselves again with the same problem? Was it already resolved? Was it already stated? And what new ideas did they co uh, contribute to this problem or their solution? Well, we might say that the matter was no longer a problem to the prophets, since Asaph had given the solution. but that they mentioned these two points because it gave them great pain when they saw with their own eyes wicked men prosper and righteous men suffer. For actual seeing of a thing causes more pain than mere knowing about it. A person is moved more by what which he perceives with his senses than by which he merely knows. And though he has no doubt whatsoever of its reality. For example, Moses was told by God on the mountain, Go, get thee down, for thy people have made them a molten calf. And since God had told them this, he had no doubt it was true. And yet, that did not prevent him from taking the tables or the tablets down with him, and he did not want to leave them on the mountain. But when he came near to the camp and saw the calf with his own eyes, he became angry and cast the tables, the tablets, and broke them at the foot of the mountain. And we see thus that he was more affected by what he saw with his eyes being moved by pain and anger than by what we heard, though he knew that what that, that which God had told him was absolutely true. In the same way, in the same way, it's possible to say that when the prophets saw with their own eyes righteous men suffer and the wicked men prosper, they were grieved and complained as a sick man complains of his sickness. Even if he knew that the cause of his sickness in advance and knew that this is a clear statement that he must get sick, nevertheless he does not keep him from complaining when he's sick. This is clear from the statement of Jeremiah who stated right wouldest thou be O Lord were I to contend with thee he means I know that thou art right and thy judgments are correct when I counted with thee and when I complain of this matter and yet I cannot forget the sorrow I feel same sense of sorrow when you see a person who dedicated his or her life entirely to Torah teaching and then passes away. You look and you think and you say, you know, is this fair? And yet we say, Baruch HaDayin HaEmet. He means that he knows that God's right and that his judgments are correct. And yet there's that sense of, of sadness and hurt and feelings. Wherefore does the way of the wicked prosper? How can, you know, we can, we can imagine this is supposed to happen to the bad people, to the wicked people, to those who are stealing and those who are doing all types of things without no remorse whatsoever. They can look at you in the eye 
and lie to you. Obviously, like our current uh, president. We might say, therefore, that all the prophets were in the same position. But this is altogether unsatisfactory, and it's not in agreement with the biblical text. It seems to me that the prophets were not troubled by the same aspects of the problem that troubled Asa. Their complaint is expressed in the words of David, Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercies, and let me not fall into the hand of a man. God's judgments are right, and a righteous man may suffer for various reasons, as we have seen. But it does not seem just that this suffering should be inflicted upon the righteous, but the wicked man himself. This leads people to find fault with God's judgment, and the Torah loses its hold upon them. This is indicated in the expression of Habakkuk, Habakkuk's complaint. For the wicked doth beset the righteous, and therefore right goeth forth perverted. He knew that Israel had sinned and deserved punishment, but he complained because of the punishment was inflicted upon them through though or through the wicked Nebuchadnezzar. The proper thing would have been to that this punishment should have come from God as a plague or a fa famine or a sickness, such as the afflicted Job, or that Jerusalem should be overthrown instantaneously like Sodom. We could say even that Washington should be overthrown instantaneously like Sodom, and not the wicked should be beset the righteous. To show that this is the meaning of his complaint, he says, Wherefore lookest thou when thou deal treacherously, and holdest thy peace when the wicked swallows up a man that is more righteous than he? He does not say swallow up the righteous, simply, but the man that is more righteous than he. His meaning is that the Israelites are not indeed absolutely righteous men, but they are more righteous than the wicked Nebuchadnezzar, who swallowed them up. And this was a complaint. Why does God arrange the world so that the wicked should inflict evil upon the person more righteous than he, though he is not absolutely righteous? The Jeremiah complaint was the same kind, by the way. He complained that the men of Anatot were who were wicked men and pursued him, seeking his life and desiring to make him drink poison without his knowledge. Think about this for a moment. Exactly what's happening on a global level. As the global elitists are trying to basically disseminate the world's population by contrivance of law and by creating weapons of armaments of of um, biological weaponry to kill off humanity and push the world into the brink of self-destruction. But I was like a docile lamb that is led to the slaughter, said Jeremiah, and I knew not that they had devised devices against me. Let us destroy the tree with fruit thereof, and let us cut him off from the land of the living. This is that his name may not be remembered anymore. If not for the divine providence, he would have fallen into their hands, as it says, and the Lord gave me knowledge of it, and I knew it. Then thou shouldest show me their doings. The point of the complaint is not that it is not just that God should use the wicked man as an instrument to avenge himself on the wicked, as I explained in discussion of prosperity of the wicked, under the third heading. The point is that the, of the criticism is that it leads men to suspect God's justice. And thus Habakkuk says, Therefore the law is, is, is slacked. The right doth never go forth. Solomon had the same thing in mind when he said, As a troubled fountain in a corrupted spring, so is righteous man that giveth way before the wicked. The meaning is this, just as the harm and the injury of a troubled fountain had corrupted springs do not affect the fountain of the spring, but those who look at it and uses it, who are grieved at seeing their fountain troubled and their springs corrupted, so when a righteous man gives forth, gives way before the wicked, there is no harm done to the righteous, for he knows that the suffering which are inflicted upon him 
are for his own good in order to wipe out the few iniquities which he has. He knows also that God has many ways of punishing those who transgresses his will. It makes no difference to him whether his sin is atoned for through a serpent or a lion or some other animal or through a wicked man. But the harm is that it's done is so that the spectator would, who would throw suspicion upon God's judgment and say, so and so is absolutely wicked, and that he did harm to so and so, who is more righteous than he, though he is not an absolutely righteous man. And it will be seen to them that the thing is unjust, and that it is really unjust. For Habakkuk himself explain, explains it when he says, O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment. O thou, O rock, has established them for correction. The meaning is that the wicked man is nothing more than an instrument with which God exercises judgment upon the wicked, and he also corrects the righteous through it, causing them pain and grief in order to wipe out the few iniquities which they have so that they may uh, merit life. The world to come and the wicked man may perish instantaneously and forever as all the seed of Nebuchadnezzar perished while Israel returned from Babylon's exile and prospered. Finally, Rabbi Abo states this regarding the complexities of why it bothered so much the prophets and they repeat on the topic. The upshot of, all it, of, of it all is that the sufferings, all sufferings of the righteous are for a good purpose and the prosperity of the wicked is for a bad purpose. In other words, the ends are different. But the character of a thing as good or bad is determined by the purpose. This is the way we must understand that all the prophets in the sages, some of them speak of the point of view of Asaph and Job, some of the point of view of Habakkuk and Jeremiah. And this will suffice as a discussion under the providence. Keep in mind, we're looking under providence in two different aspects. One has to do exactly when the righteous faces adversity and the wicked seems like if they prosper, then they have no problem in life. Take a look at a current contemporary situation where we see two figures in our history here in the United States, both having committed the same styles of errors and yet they are completely treated differently. One is getting away with it. Clearly he's guilty as heck and yet it seems that he's prospering, that nothing can touch him. This is an example of a wicked. And look at the other one who's doing everything in his possibility even though he's made mistakes just like the previous yet he's being drilled and grilled by the hands of the wicked, which is, in fact, an instrument. But there is retribution to come. And this we begin to take a look at in chapter 16 when providence, and it prospers to follow up with this discussion and prayer, which will be the next uh, chapter that we'll be taking a look at in Rabbi Albo's discussion regarding Sefer HaKarim and all of this idea under the heading of providence. So stay tuned, be part of the Ways of Israel, and enjoy our classes that we give out every morning and every afternoon in Spanish. And hopefully soon we'll have a live interaction via Zoom. So be happy, be content, and be connected with Torah and Torah values. Shalom, shalom. Shabbat shalom.